So why is the Hyundai Ioniq 5 such a highly rated car right now? Not just by us, but by seemingly anyone and everyone who comes into contact with it. And what are the practicalities and costs of running it every day? Well, I've just spent two weeks with and done just over 1,000 miles in the top spec ultimate all-wheel drive version. And so here is a little film about what I now think could just be the world's best electric car. So here you go, here's the realities of driving an EV because it's had to be delivered on that truck. <laughs> Looks cool though, but they have to deliver it on the truck because basically that's the mileage that you need. Thanks Wes. Right, so let's have a good look at it. It's a dead cool looking thing. Dead cool looking thing. The bloke that designed the Lamborghini Murcielago designed this. Luke Donkerbolker. And a fine job he has done too. Right, let's go inside and have a closer look. I mean, the first thing you notice on the move in the Ionic 5 is this just delightful sense of refinement. Near silent movement down the road. The suspension is really nicely refined on this car. No matter what kind of setting you put it in, which we'll come to in a bit. This seat could maybe do with a touch more support, but fundamentally it's, it's just great. The driving environment, all this stuff here, these instruments, it's just great. It's just, it's just really a quality, interesting, futuristic, well-designed environment in which to find yourself. It's deeply impressive, this car, in the first mile or so. But I'm going to spend a lot more time with this thing just to kind of try and get right beneath its skin. Drive it on all sorts of different roads, different weather conditions, different temperatures, and just find out how good Auto Express's current car of the year actually is. Right, here's the weird world of car journalism. At the moment I've got this Ionic 5, as you know, but I've also got that thing. 180 odd grand's worth of euros next to that. Well, there you go. That's uh, that's what I've got on test at the moment. The Arnic 5, interesting, clean, relevant, and that. Hyundai claims you can charge an Ionic from 10 to 80% in just 18 minutes. But that's only at a handful of super fast 350 kW charge points, and there are less than 20 of those in the UK. At a 50 kW point like this, it takes just over an hour to go from 10 to about 90% full, so from 20 miles to around 200 miles in range. But at a 7 kW point, it's nearer 10 hours, and at a 3 kW lamppost point like this one, make that 15 hours. Even on a 10.5 kW home wall box point, it takes a good six hours to juice from 20 miles to over 200 miles. So although the outright range is good, and the car, as I'm discovering, is excellent, charging remains a major issue. One that's getting better, yes, but nowhere near at a fast enough pace, yet. I've done, what have I done now? Four, 500 miles in the Ionic 5, at all sorts of speeds, on all sorts of roads. And I'm falling for it more and more. And to drive, it's really good. In some ways, it's just fabulous. I mean, it's so refined. It's a big car, this. The wheelbase is ever so slightly longer than an Audi A8, I gather. And I had it next to a Lamborghini Urus, as you may have seen. And it's kind of the same size as a Urus. This, however, even though it's roughly the same sort of size as that, feels like a fairly small, nimble, agile little car. And I'm not quite sure how they've managed to do it because this thing still weighs more than two tonnes. And it does have all this room in it. And it is physically big, but it doesn't feel it on the move. 
You can't say it feels like an Audi or like a Mercedes or like an anything. It feels like a Hyundai Ionic 5 inside. And that is right up there amongst the best as far as I'm concerned at this price level. I know 50 grand's a lot of money, but this feels like 50 grand's worth of car. The suspension is quite soft, which is why you have this lovely ride. This is a very busy road I'm on at the moment. But it's, it, all the fine tuning is just really nicely sorted on this car. And as a result, you get on a road like this, the one at Beachy Head, and you immediately want to dial it up to sport mode and give it some beans. And when you do, it's just excellent. It's really quite good fun to drive, is this car. And when, not if, they stick an M badge on this thing. And it has a lot more power and a lot more torque and possibly some trick stuff going on with its gear changing as well, according to the rumour mill. It's just going to be blinding. An N version of this car is going to be absolutely monstrous. <laughs> it's already really fast and really good fun to drive this car. But with the Beerman treatment, i.e. the N treatment, <laughs> sky's the limit. Okay, I really do like the interior of this thing. I mean, it's a pretty space age, but there are so many touches that are just really cool, like this bit here, that. I mean, why don't, why don't more manufacturers think of that? So you can just get it out of the way if you want to, or you can put it all the way forwards if you want to. This glove box actually isn't a glove box. It's a glove drawer. That's because there's no gubbins under there. Well, gubbins called an engine. So this bit here, drive mode, this is probably the most important bit. So press your drive mode, you've got eco, normal and sport. And what this affects, so as you can see, I've got 158 miles on the range. But as soon as you go into sport, that falls to 153 miles, which actually isn't that bad considering we've got 81% worth of battery left, as you can see there. But it does shift up to 163 if you put it into eco. So it kind of leaves you with this slightly underlying sense of paranoia about wanting to keep as much range as you possibly can. You've got this bit here as well, which is search stations that you're just going to learn eventually that the paranoia about running out of range does probably fade over time, but that hasn't just reached me yet. I'm still totally worried about looking at the range the whole time. One lovely thing that I just think is delightful. You've got all these settings for nav and God knows what, but as we are up here on the beachy head road, I'm going to select calm ocean waves. <laughs> How cool is that? And if you don't like calm ocean waves, we can go for, don't know why you'd ever go for a rainy day, or open air cafe. Warm fireplace is quite nice, but the trouble with that is I, I genuinely think I'd nod off behind the wheel if I had that selected all the time. I quite like snowy village. Something quite chilled about that. That's quite nice too. But given where we are, I think calm ocean waves is pretty appropriate. The Ionic is practical, no question about that. There are all sorts of nice little touches that make it different and good. But in fundamental terms, it's about as roomy as a big hatchback gets, with loads of space in all directions, in all four seats, as you can see, plus a huge double layered boot at the back. Here's another nice touch too. Okay, here's yet another dead cool thing. I'm sitting in a lay-by now, so I'm putting the left-hand indicator stalk on, which is totally safe. Look at that, you've got a camera all the way down the left-hand side of the car. Obviously there are cameras all over the car, but that just shows you what's down the left-hand side of the car, so you can't turn left into a cyclist or an electric scooter rider or anything, basically. And then I'll put the indicator onto the right, and you get the same thing there. That's just great. I haven't seen that before. Why not? There are so many things on this car that you've never seen on any other cars, and you think, why hasn't someone else thought of that? 
The lithium ion battery in this ultimate AWD Ionic is rated at 253 kW. That's the power. And it has a 73 kWh capacity, which gives it the equivalent of 301 bhp and 605 newton meters of torque. So although it weighs just over two tons, that's still enough to fire it to 62 miles an hour in just 5.2 seconds and to a top speed of 115 miles an hour. So it's quick and it will get even quicker still once the end division has worked its magic on the car. And as far as running costs are concerned, well look, think of it like this. In a petrol car that does 40 mpg, you currently get between five and six miles per pound when unleaded costs £1.45 a litre. In this top spec Ionic, you get at worst 10 miles per pound if you use the fastest, most expensive charging points. Use the cheaper, slower points, like the ones you can use overnight, or better still a wall box, and you'll get nearer 25 miles from one pound. And in the less potent versions, you'll get over 30 miles per pound. Question is, are the Ionic's massively reduced running costs enough to offset the higher initial asking price and more crucially, the far longer, far less convenient charge times compared with an efficient petrol or hybrid car? Well, that, as they say, is the $64,000 question. Tell you what, numbers like that all of a sudden seem even more ridiculous from behind the wheel of this vehicle. Mm. So then the nice man from Hyundai came back with his truck and it was time to say goodbye to the Ionic 5. A car I'd come to be surprised and delighted by to begin with and then just completely blown away by overall. No, the quality of the infrastructure that supports it still isn't anything like as good as the car itself. But look, when that moment arrives, and it will, albeit eventually at the current rate, the future on four wheels doesn't just look bright, it looks dazzling. And at the moment, the Ionic 5 is very much the star of the show.